Welcome to the 952nd meeting of the, month, uh, of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston, founded in 1934. And uh, uh, we are now uh, one of the largest um, and oldest astronomy clubs um, in the nation, um, especially after the Bond Astronomical Society uh, joined forces with us in 1973. We have a nice meeting tonight. Mario Mata is, gonna, uh, is our guest speaker tonight, and he'll give a his uh, final report on UN efforts uh, regarding light pollution. So I am going to, without further ado, just begin. This is Glenn's attempt at humor uh, uh, for the attempt. month. Are okay, you with you us, Glenn? Okay? Can I can you hear, hear you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I drew this cartoon actually for a Deep Sky magazine way back in the 1970s sometime. Otherwise, the Barker there in the middle, I would have probably drawn in uh, Mario Mata instead. I know he'd love that job. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. I think we all appreciate that would be a great target as a, a light post. And our saying for the month, to combine our attention to terrestrial matters would be to limit the human spirit. And that was, came from uh, our good friend, Stephen Hawking, the astrophysicist. And it's a good thought. Next slide. And go ahead, Rich, I'll let you take over. Uh, before you do, though, I did want to bring something up. Uh, I've been looking at the sun with a, a, an H alpha filter recently, and it's been very active. There are a couple of really active sunspot groups. In the last few days, there's been a beautiful prominence on one edge of the sun. And uh, it didn't see as much activity today with the sunspots, but the past two days, it was a lot of, they were very bright. So let's have, that had to be flare activity. So if you have that type of telescope, a, a, a solar telescope, check it out. And even if you don't, the, the sun's been very spectacular in white light. So if you have a good white light filter for your scope, check it out. We're finally getting some activity after all these years when nothing was going on. And I'll turn it over to you, Rich. Well, I was going to say, you're right, Glenn, they're, they're, the sun has been fairly active over the last week or so. There was a very large group of sunspots that has now since rotated out of the way. Um, but um, what I try to do, well, every morning I look at the, um, the latest um, from spaceweather.com, I look at a white light view. And then on um, the National Solar Observatory, I look at the uh, current H alpha view. And if it looks exciting, you know, I send out emails to everybody in the hopes that you'll have time and opportunity to go out and take a look. Remember, always be very careful looking at the sun. If you don't know what you're doing, don't observe the sun. Um, white, light teles white light telescopes will show you the sunspots, uh, granulation if the air is steady and some faculae. Um, H alpha scopes, of course, will show you prominences, flares, uh, dark filaments, um, lots of detail to be seen on the sun. But again, if you don't know what you're doing, ask somebody at the clubhouse to help you out and we'll get you on the right track. Can you, uh, can you, you can hear the solar activity on, on the radio be, be, oh, as a ham radio operator. Really? You hear okay. activity on high frequencies. I know there was a radio blackout, a shortwave blackout or a greatly diminished ability to transmit just the other day because of a big flare, um, an yep. X-class flare um, yep. that occurred. Yeah, there's lots of stuff going on in the sun. And you're right, Glenn, that we're, we're moving now towards the solar max, expected sometime in, in early summer of 2025. So the mm. show will just continue to get better over the next uh, few years. So um, keep tuned to that. Now, of course, opposite the sun on May 15th, we have a full moon. And we're fortunate enough to be able to witness a total lunar eclipse. I have a slide about that next. But um, if, you, if you're out there observing in the evening skies, um, you know there aren't very many planets to see. Mercury is now too faint, getting too close to the sun. Um, Uranus is in the same boat. Um, the big planets are all still morning objects. Uh, if for early ri risers, if you're up on Sunday, May 22nd, Saturn is only five is five degrees north of the moon. Again, look southeast just before dawn. The rest of this is all just before dawn. Um, three mornings later, the moon is south of Jupiter and Mars. On Friday the 27th, Venus is three degrees west of the moon. And on Sunday, May 29th, uh, very similar to what we saw at the end of April with Venus and Jupiter, um, Mars and Jupiter will be a half a degree apart. And again, look to the east before dawn. Now, I, the, to go back to the Jupiter-Venus conjunction, I hope you all get a chance to go out and take a look at that. Um, and I, I really hope you have the time to follow those two planets into daylight. Venus is an easy daytime object if you, you know, know how to find it. Um, at times, Venus can be seen with the naked eye in broad daylight. It helps that the moon is near as a guidepost to get you on the right, sort of in the right ballpark. 
But back on April 30th, I was able to follow Venus and Jupiter well into the daylight. And um, it was kind of fun. I actually didn't follow them. I, I went out at about 10 o'clock in the morning, acquired Venus, and there in the same low power field of view, I could see Jupiter. So it was, it was kind of cool, actually. Um, did someone have a comment? I thought I heard someone just want to make a comment. No? Okay. Well, at the end of May, um, another opportunity exists. I don't know how easy it'll be to see Mars in the daylight. And Jupiter is very washed out and really hard to see in the daytime. But by following it into the daylight, you might be able to see those two guys. Anyway, here's the um, lunar eclipse. So on Sunday night, the umbral phase begins at 1028 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Totality begins at 1129. Totality ends at 1254 a.m. on Monday morning. And the umbral phase, the partial eclipse, ends at 1.56 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, there was a volcanic eruption relatively recently. And there's been some speculation that this may be a, a fairly dark um, lunar eclipse. Um, if you want to see the circumstances like this, um, here's the path of the moon as it passes through the umbral part of the Earth's shadow. And it's not a... It's not exactly a central eclipse, but I would expect that this part of the moon up here would be considerably darker than we normally see it, um, with a bit of you know a bit brighter part down here. Um, it'll be a fun event. It's late at night. Um, set your alarm clock or take a nap. Um, maybe take the day off from work on Monday to watch the whole event. But um, it's uh, it's a fun thing to watch. Um, I know you've all seen them. Whoops, where did my cursor go? I know you've all seen them before. Um, this picture I took back in the 2019 eclipse. Do you remember how cold it was that morning? Hmm. It was so cold that night. But astronomy waits for no one, yes? And so if you're not there on the 16th, 15th, 16th of May, or if it's cloudy here, the eclipse, I promise you, will come and go. So I hope you get a chance to get out there and take a look at it. Um, I alerted everybody to um, one of the websites I look at every morning, um, lists current supernovae. And um, we were treated uh, this past month to um, a supernova, uh, supernova 2022 HRS in the galaxy NGC 4574, I think. Eh, I always get those numbers mixed up. Uh, 4647. 4647. Thank you, Glenn. This is M60 right here. And I know we, we did a lot of observing of this uh, nova, supernova um, from the clubhouse. Um, the last time I checked, it was about 12 and a half magnitude. Um, it may be a little bit dimmer now, but um, some of our members took some nice, got some nice images and passed them along to us. So do you want to review those, Glenn? And I'll, um, I'll press the slides forward. Sure, I did check it out. The, uh, the supernova became visible sometime around mid-April. And I think these pictures were taken, uh, I think uh, April 19th seems to stand. And I don't, yeah, April 19th, Chris Elledge has it labeled there from the Middleman Observatory. And actually back then it was still growing in brightness. Uh, we'll go to the next two slides, because these four See? folks also have images of our uh, challenge objects. So I'll let them talk about those pictures. While you were talking, Glenn, I just called up that website, and they have the they have um, the supernova listed at magnitude twelve point three, which makes it a, a nice, easy backyard target for yeah, not only imagers but to visual observers as well. I did check the A uh, the AVSO website. And uh, I saw readings more like the low 12s now, getting toward 13th magnitude. It seemed to have peaked at about 12.5 shortly after these pictures were taken. Uh, apparently, it's, I know I did see a 12.3, so somebody had it that. A lot of the ones I saw were more getting toward 13. Uh, I haven't had a check recently because our friend the moon is back in the sky. There is Mario would attest, so it's getting a lot higher to see this. But it, it, again, it, it, I would think once the moon is out of the way, it still should be at least in the mid-13s and visible with a 6, seven, uh, six to eight and 10 inch telescope. Right, and there it is right there. Yeah. And there it is right there. Very nice. You know, the, you know, the thing is that galaxy is uh, one of the, uh, the statistics I got is 63 million light years away. So you're looking at that. And if you were there looking back at the earth, you'd see the earth just about 2 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Mammals would just be starting to get a, a, a hold on the, the Earth at that particular time, 63 million light years. The other thing I think of is that supernova is visible in a bubble 63 million light years across the universe. So how many galaxies has this light passed? And I think I've said this before with a supernova, how many other 
pairs of eyes or visual detectors, whatever you want to call it, have seen this particular supernova within that galaxy, again, probably 63 million years ago, up to right now, 63 million uh, light years away as we are and continuing outward. But this you look at that star compared to its galaxy and it's the same brightness as the galaxy. So one star during supernova can outshine everything else in the galaxy. Well, you, you know, you're right, Glenn, in this galaxy, that, the pair of them right there, as a matter of fact, every galaxy you see in the picture are part of the Virgo supercluster. Yeah. And so that, that region of the universe is packed with galaxies. So, it's, you know, you're right. How many um, other galaxies has the light of that supernova passed by over the last 63 million years? Pretty impressive. Um, uh, Rich? Sure. This is Mark Helton. Um, you had mentioned also that there's another object uh, around M60, like the most, uh, it's yep. like the most compact dwarf galaxy. Can you show, I'm trying to figure out where that is. It's that right there. That's it, an M60. Right there. Do we have, okay. do we have, <clears throat> I know, do we have a pick, who's? Because that's well, another really cool. On the uh, other, it's on the other side. See the two little d dim stars oh, over here? Yeah, yeah that's what, right. It's the one to the right. So it's this, right okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I just know it was bright. Thank you. I've been trying to find figure out which which one of the dots. It, that's another really cool target that you pointed out the other day when you emailed. If you do, if you do a, a, a search for uh, on the um, astronomy picture of the day, for M60, what the, when I looked it up, the first hit uh, was showcase that little dense dwarf galaxy. And that'll give you a great finder chart for it. Um, that image, I think it's a Hubble image, but you're, you're right. I, thanks for correcting me. It is, it's that guy right there. Hmm. Perfect. All right, let's move forward here, Glenn. Let's see what we got. Okay, uh, yes. yep. This month's uh, the May Observer's Challenge is Messier 106. And it's located about middle. I know the stars aren't labeled there, but that star, kind of the heel of the bowl, uh, that's Fecta or Gamma Ursa Majoris. And you look down Cor Caroli, yeah. the double star in Canis Venatus, it's about halfway down, but that's kind of a crapshoot if you're trying to do uh, uh, star hopping. I went from Fecta, Gamma Ursa Majoris, and the chart over at the right there shows that 2.4 magnitude star, that's that one. And I went basically straight uh, eastward, and there's a double star, just a wide pair of stars. Here. And from there, I dipped down to that 4.8 magnitude star. That is, I think it's five Ursa Majoris. And then another drop of a couple of degrees, that gets you into Canis Venatici. That's three Canis Venaticorum. And the galaxy was just uh, two degrees below it, and very easy to pick up. It's very bright. Now, the first time I saw it was... Uh, way back in the early 1970s with that little three-inch Edmund reflecting telescope I own. I saw it back then. More recently, I checked it out with my 10-inch reflector. It's got a very concentrated nucleus, kind of odd shape to me, with the, the spiral arms going out in different directions. And we'll have a couple of uh, images that were taken. I'll let the, uh, the members who took those take over. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is by Doug Paul. Is Doug Paul uh, here tonight? He is. Uh, yep, I'm here. Um, so this one, you'd comment it was fairly bright. Uh, well, the center portion is, but the surrounding portion is not. So I had to crank it up to uh, four hours instead of my usual two with a, a six inch uh, aperture. But uh, anyhow, that's, uh, that's what I came up with. Pretty good. Nice, bright, Thank nice, you. And, nice and deep. Thank you. Yeah, I think what I saw with the small scope, well, it's in Mario's picture. That bright central part there is right, what I was yeah. able to pick out visually. The other part there is going to take uh, some type of astral imaging. Okay, next I think was Mario's, and we'll let Mario speak up from Florida. No, he's I'm, I'm here in Massachusetts. In oh, Washington. you're back. Yeah. Oh, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, this was taken a couple of years, I think uh, two years ago, uh, with the 32-inch. And at the time I had the new ZWO uh, camera because I had an earlier picture from 10 years ago, but it clipped both ends because uh, the ZWO has a much bigger field of view. Um, so it's a very large telescope. Visually in Florida, I did look at it and I imaged it with the 14 inch just to see what, how it would come out. Uh, the central part is visual. The outer part, you're just not gonna see. 
So this, I think, is a couple of hours worth with the 32. But what's remarkable about it is, is a lot of, uh, there's an inner spiral, is one arm. Um, oh, I, actually, you can't see my pointer. Um, I'm here. Yeah, there's an inner spiral, and then there's an outer spiral. Uh, and I just think that's pretty remarkable. And all those bright spots are just numerous, absolutely numerous H-alpha regions. Uh, a few nights ago, in fact, I retook this with the 32 inch, about four and a half hours worth in red, green, and blue in H-alpha, but I didn't have, haven't had a chance to put it together yet. Surprisingly, very little H-alpha signal came through, but the red, green, blue should be fine. But uh, I'm in the middle of, uh, given a talk to Roland, uh, which is that European wide uh, meeting. And I had to get up at four this morning. So I'm a little sleepy right now and I have to get up tomorrow early as well and give a talk. <laughs> so, you, 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 you must be a little sleepy, Mario, because I think I just heard you say you looked at this visually. Does that, you actually own some eyepieces? Is that, is that true? I, I, I actually do, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> we, we might get you back into the fold someday. <laughs> You know what I observe most when people come over and uh, visit, sure. because that forces me to observe, and that's great. So I actually like visitors because it makes me look through the eyepiece. Other than that, I'm always either doing a transit, collecting imaging, or something else. But that's you're right; I don't observe as much as I should. That's okay. No, it's all good. Hey, thank you. That's an awesome image. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, Glenn. Yes. You cut me off. I just I'm, uh, while I was in I. Uh, Monday, uh, this past weekend, I was in North Carolina for a, a COLA meeting. That's the group that uh, uh, regulates uh, laboratories, and I represent the AMA at it. But uh, Roger Avester came and had uh, lunch with me. Oh, nice. And he, he told me to tell you that uh, he's still miffed that you missed two of his invites to come talk. <laughs> I should probably expound on that. I was invited to give a talk uh, back in 2017. And just months before the talk, I found out I had a heart condition. I had to have a pacemaker. Yeah, that one he forgives you for. It's the oh. second one he doesn't. Oh, the second. <laughs> Literally, I'm sitting at home. It's one in the morning. I was supposed to travel. I was supposed to leave at two in the morning to go to Manchester Airport to take the plane out. I heard this crash. I looked outside and a pine tree had fallen across the driveway, took out wires to the house. And I literally had to cancel hours before my talk. I felt really bad. They haven't contacted me since then. And uh, I don't know, maybe three strikes is bad because I don't know what could happen to me to make me miss a, four, a third one. So I'm going to leave it at that right now. But yeah, a tree literally <laughs> an hour before the, I was supposed to leave for the talk. It came right down in front of the driveway. Thank you for reminding about that, Mario. Sure. <laughs> thanks, yeah, thanks for yep, opening up the old wounds. <laughs> Well, let's see who else has, has contributed here. Yeah, Mark Helton. Yeah, this is Mark's. I, uh, yeah, I found this actually to be a very difficult uh, target, which surprises me. But the, the weather has not been cooperative uh, up here. And actually, I was going to set up tonight, and a big bank of fog just rolled in. So, uh, but yeah, I was able to finally get an image. I did it. This was my second attempt, and I only think I got 10 images to stack and I was just able to bring the outer part of the galaxy out which um, and I'm getting better at picks now so that's been very helpful it by the way does is this a barred galaxy or not is it just spiral because it looks you know, like I, it's kind of got a barred it's barred, it's, barred yes. it's on the cusp yeah it's on the cusp yeah it looks like it's kind of got a little barred uh, in there but yeah, uh, I, I would like to go back and try it again when I have a clear, much clearer night, so. Great, thanks, Mark. Let me find where my cursor is going, here it is. And this mm -hmm. is Chris. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, Chris, this is, uh, the, yeah, the, the middleman. Um, I spent, I think this was taken over several nights. Um, it's hard to tell with the middleman sometimes. <laughs> um, you have two hours of luminance data, which is which is what brings in all the detail, and then um, have 30, uh, 30 minutes of the Sloan red uh, Sloan R filter, the um, the uh, Bessel V filter, and the Johnson's Cousins B filter, and those are just mapped to RGB. 
in lots and lots of background galaxies. <laughs> mm. yeah, look at that. That's crazy. Fantastic. Great image. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So here we are, June Observer's Challenge. You yeah, talk this, about it? Glenn, this is a weird one. Yeah, I apologize. I think this was taken by a club member. A lot of you were focusing on M101, uh, the Pinwheel Galaxy in Ursa Major. And the challenge is just a few degrees away from that. Uh, they're in the same wide field of view, but and this is a tough object. I think it's about a 12th magnitude galaxy, if, I correct, if I'm correct, maybe 11th, 12th magnitude. I did try it out recently visually, and I had to wait and wait, and I could see a ghostly glimmer with, with the averted vision. I could just see a ghostly circular glimmer, so I'm pretty sure I caught it, but I'm waiting for a, a better night. And I by the way, I believe this was taken by an ATMOB member, so if uh, this was taken by one of you out there, could you... Uh, Maybe speak up and tell us about this picture. I believe it was taken by a member of the club. Yeah, this is mine, uh, okay. Doug. Um, that uh, the uh, originally I took a two-hour exposure on it, and uh, so much of it looks fuzzy that uh, it looked like it needed more exposure. But uh, surprisingly, uh, two more hours only added a small amount to it. So it's. Uh, uh, I guess a little brighter than uh, than I thought. Uh, anywho, uh, that's that's my. I guess you have my submission for next month already. Perfect. I think visually this is going to be a this is a really tough object. It um, is again. I, I start with the averted vision. I've got magnitude five skies out here. I would expect it to be visible for twenty five inches at the clubhouse, but yeah, it's a challenge. I did like I say. I saw a very ghostly. Glimmer. It's going to be beyond my little three-inch scope. Forget that. But I'll I'll try a better view with the 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 ten-inch and hope you folks out there do the same. And I guess I'll close uh, as always. Keep looking up and and send in those those pictures of this galaxy, and we'll try to get them set up on the the website and on the uh, the newsletter. Thanks that's, again. That's great, Glenn. Thank you. I I just want to say you know again with a with a just because this galaxy is faint doesn't mean you should not try to go see it. Take whatever telescope you have. Obviously, the more aperture, perhaps the better. It's hard to know sometimes. Play with your eyepiece magnifications to darken the background. A lot of deep sky observers seem to think that visually eyepieces are telescope eyepiece systems with exit pupils between two and three millimeters uh, offer um, the best uh, view. So keep that in mind. And when it comes to really faint galaxies like this, maybe make this the one object you'll look for and see on a particular night, which means you'll spend a ton of time on it. Because sometimes these really faint galaxies, uh, I'm gonna bring up a quote that's often attributed to Michael Covington, that each galaxy deserves at least 15 minutes of your time. If you find this star field, you know I don't know how faint these stars are, but if you find these stars, and you know the galaxies in here somewhere in the middle. Let your eye grow accustomed to it. Let your eye soak in the photons. And soon, soon you may start to see, like Glenn said, sometimes they look so ghostly, you're not even sure it's there. Play with averted vision. Jiggle the telescope. That's an old time trick for looking at finding, seeing very, very faint, diffuse objects. Give the scope a little jiggle. Tap it because the human eye is very good um, when the light levels are low at detecting motion. And so if you jiggle your scope a little bit, that object might just suddenly appear. And now you know where it is. And as your eye gets more and more used to it, you'll, it'll be easier and easier to view. And in an you hour- Do you know the medical reason why that works? I don't. We have rods and cones in our eyes. Yep. Cones are for you know, uh, color vision, the rods for night vision, but they're about half the rods are in the periphery, uh, well, about 20 degrees out and beyond. And they're, they've, they've evolved so you can see a tiger sneaking up on your movement. So they react to movement only. So when you jiggle it, you see it not only with the rods for stationary stuff, but you're using the rods for motion as well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, the, yeah the, those tigers in the dark are dangerous because you, you do want to see them coming. So are skunks. <laughs> <laughs> You always want to keep an eye out for a skunk. All right, Mario, thank you. Now we get to our guest speaker, Dr. Mario Motter. He, know, he needs no introduction, but I'm going to read what I have on the board here anyway. So 
and you, as you notice, Mario, it's a very trimmed down uh, version of your bio, but Mario is a graduate of Boston College with a BS in physics and biology and an MD from Tufts Medical School. He has been long active in organized medicine, both in the American Medical Association, that's the AMA, and in the Massachusetts Medical Society, the MMS, holding a number of posts uh, through the years. Mario has enjoyed a lifelong interest in astronomy and has hand-built several telescopes, including his entirely homemade 32-inch F6 relay telescope and three observatories to do astronomical research. He has served as a president of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston and has served as a council member and then president of the AAVSO, uh, the American Association of Vero Star Observers, and has served on the board of the International Dark Sky Association. Mario has been awarded the La Las Cumbres Award uh, from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in 2003 and the Walter, the Walter Scott Houston Award from the Northeast Section of the Astronomical League and the Henry Alcott Award from the AAVSO in 2017. Finally, in 2013, the International Astronomical Union awarded Mario uh, an asteroid in part for his work on light pollution as well as amateur research. Asteroid 133537, Mario Mata, is currently shining at magnitude plus 20.9 in the constellation of Perseus. Don't try to image it, it's pretty close, to, well, it's behind the sun, but the sun will be a great interference. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Mario, you should be able to jump right in and share your screen. And let's give, let's all of us give a nice round of applause to our very own Mario Mata. Woo! Okay, now I'm unmuted. <laughs> Let me uh, first slide. Come on. There we go. Okay. So you can see my screen now, right? Okay. So uh, this is it, it's an interesting story. Um, I was invited to be part of a UN meeting uh, regarding, it was put up by the International Astronomical Union and by Spain. They always have to have one country who actually anchors it. And the whole purpose of it was to, it, it started off to protect observatories and then with Starlink, uh, by the way, that's Musk, not, uh, not the Amazon, uh, he's the other one. Um, a, they really got concerned because of the threat to uh, observational astronomy. So there's five parts to this uh, meeting. I was involved with the human health section and I was asked primarily because of my write-ups in the AMA, which uh, pointed out the dangers of excessive light pollution. So you already went through this, but this is more for the sake of new members since we haven't really met for two and a half years. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of new members who actually don't know me. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, anyways, I, um, I'll, I'll say one thing. I teach medical students, they come to the office and to the hospital and residents, but I also taught, uh, got a professorship, uh, associate professorship to teach astronomy at Tufts undergraduate, which I did for a couple of years when uh, they needed someone to do it since the, it was an undergraduate beginner's course uh, for non-majors and no real professor wanted to dirty their hands with unwashed non-science majors. So they asked me to do it, but I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, so let me move on here. This is my observatory. This is again for people who That's funny, I'm hearing myself as an echo. It's been fixed. Okay. Um, anyways, this is my observatory and uh, it's in Gloucester. And my sky is about uh, 5.4, 5.5 mag, depending whether you're east to west. That's my scope, it's 32 inch. Again, what? <laughs> I'm not talking there. What what's going on? You're the only person unmuted at the moment, so I don't know. Oh, 
Okay, never mind. I'll. Uh, I'm hearing an echo, but this is my uh, uh, scope. It's uh, uh, Scott Milligan, which many of you know, uh, designed it. Uh, since I only know how to make Newtonians, but this is a relay scope. Uh, and Scott uh, basically gave me all the designs and he helped me do some of the uh, grinding and polishing and all the mechanical parts I made and uh, ground the polished main mirror. He, he actually did the Mangan secondary, which is up here. So give him credit. And then it has four correctors. And this is my uh, picture of M1 through that scope. So why is the AMA interested in light pollution? I get asked that all the time, especially by physicians <laughs> and uh, uh, lighting engineers who basically tell me to stay in my lane and uh, leave, leave lighting to them. Uh, it's sometimes very nastily, but uh, I'll, I'll give you the reason. And this is why the UN uh, finally got involved. So light pollution, affects human health. It interferes with circadian rhythms. You can see my uh, pointer, right? Okay, good. So it suppresses melatonin and that accounts for much of the human health effects and that's becoming a major problem worldwide. It increases hormonally related cancers, increases obesity, diabetes, and mood disorders, sleep disturbances. Glare makes rot roadways undanger uh, dangerous to drive and it, it's uh, grossly affecting the environment. 60% of all, everything that lives outdoors needs dark at night. So for that reason, this got set up originally in October of uh, 2020, the first meeting was supposed to be in um, the Canary Islands. Uh, a funny thing happened called COVID and it became virtual. So I spent six months, working on the program and uh, different parts of the light pollution part that I was assigned to. And then the plan was to meet for the final product in this past year in 2021. And I actually had tickets, a hotel reserved, and so did everyone else and we're all set to go. Uh, got COVID clearance, uh, got tested and one week before the meeting, the volcano erupted. <laughs> I don't know if you all recall uh, La Palma, the volcano. Well, that's where we were supposed to meet. So everyone had to cancel literally at the last minute and it became another virtual meeting. Um, these are the internet people internationally as well as uh, myself. I'm here uh, somewhere. Where am I? Here I am. Uh, here are the leaders of the groups and uh, everyone across the world. Uh, there were, I think, 42 countries represented. We were supposed to meet in La Palma where the Europeans have their large observatories. You've probably heard of Tenerife, but La Palma is much more uh, remote and very quiet, I'm told. Uh, they have their optical observatories up top there. Um, this is where the meeting was supposed to be. <laughs> And is the observatory, which I did not go visit since uh, uh, it became a virtual meeting. So the uh, reason I got invited is because of the AMA information. So I'll give you a sort of a combination of both. Um, that led to the uh, Roland meeting, which stands for Responsible Outdoor Lighting at Night. And I'm halfway through that meeting right now. That's a European wide meeting, though, but it really is worldwide. I give a talk tomorrow early afternoon, um, similar to what I'm going to talk to you tonight about. But all the uh, world's uh, uh, major researchers on light pollution are at this meeting. Uh, so I'm uh, pleased to be part of it. Here's the Roland uh, uh, International Conference uh, program. And as you can see, you'll probably recognize quite a number of names here, at least. I I do anyways. And I had an article in, uh, uh, in that uh, that some of you have commented on. So here's my view of the Triffid Nebula. I always throw in a few pictures, taken with the 32. So what was the purpose of this meeting? 
um, I was invited for the light pollution, but again, it started off to protect astronomical observatories. A few years back when the planning for this started, uh, people were getting alarmed across the world that the observatories are going to become obsolete uh, because of the encroaching light pollution. So the first and primary reason for this program was to protect existing astronomical observatories and try to get a UN treaty on that worldwide. Next came satellite constellations. We'll talk more about that in a little while, but uh, the number of satellites that Musk and others want to put up is, to excuse a pun, astronomical. And uh, it, images will, uh, any images listening will testify to the fact that uh, anytime you get images of the sky, you're going to get a satellite trail every third or fourth. Uh, if Musk gets his way, you're going to get five or six satellite trails every image uh, because the, the sky will be populated by endless amounts of uh, satellite trails. The Vera Rubin Observatory is particularly threatened. That's the new one going up in Chile that's supposed to take several degrees of sky uh, per image and uh, basically cover the entire sky every three days looking for transient objects. That's going to be a fantastic advancement, except if that many satellites get put up because it's so sensitive, um, it'll be essentially useless. So that observatory may not even fulfill its primary goal if Musk gets his way. Radio astronomy, because of uh, all the satellites and communication to Earth, uh, there are problems with that. Dark sky oases, we'll talk about that. And light pollution, which is the section I was uh, involved with. So. Why do we, why is the UN, why was the AMA and then the UN involved with uh, uh, lighting? Primarily because, and I'll, I'll say this, uh, in 2012, I produced a report with the uh, AMA on human health effects of light pollution. And I had some help, uh, Richard Stevens, uh, George Brainerd, uh, these were all people who were tops in the field. I invited them to help me write a report. Uh, I'll fully admit I was just a glorified editor. It was all their research. But um, the uh, issue uh, is that um, when I produced the report, it made a splash in the medical literature, but the lighting industry completely ignored it, absolutely ignored it. Uh, not, not a peep. So in 2016, when the U.S. is about to switch everything to LEDs and cities were starting to do that, uh, we produced a report specifically on LEDs saying basically do LEDs but avoid blue and shield them. That, that's all it said, basically. It's a 36-page report with lots of medical peer-reviewed papers referenced but uh, you would think that's pretty mild and, and common sense. The lighting industry went ballistic, absolutely ballistic. If uh, uh, the, I got nasty letters from uh, the IES, which is the International Electrical, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. And they basically sent me a letter saying, you're nothing but a bunch of docs, stay in your lane, get out of the lighting industry, you have no concept of what you're doing, and this is our turf. That's literally what the paper said. And they were persistent. They wanted a retraction and to the point where they were sending a letter every week to the AMA until finally, at the time I was on the um, uh, Council on Science Public Health, and they sent, they asked me, should we invite them to a conference? Should we? Uh, modified things, I says, we have 126 peer-reviewed paper. I hope everyone knows what a peer-reviewed paper is. I mean, that's basically, it's proven and it's been reviewed by experts. 126 peer-reviewed papers that, that give us side. They haven't produced one paper that says they're right. So basically they craft a letter saying, we'll be happy to meet with you if you provide any uh, evidence-based information that we can discuss. It's now six years later, the IES has not produced one paper, not one. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, they can blow smoke until they actually pr prove anything they wanna say. Um, 
So for that reason, uh, the, uh, the uh, international uh, committees were, got involved in, to protect the environment and protect uh, the observatories. And I got invited because of the, to represent the AMA. So that sky oasis, uh, the UN is actually quite interested in this. They want to protect a number of places around the world. Now we call them IDA dark sky places uh, in the US, but uh, they call them dark sky oasis internationally. And here's the number, there's 223 as of uh, earlier this year. Um, and they're broken down from dark sky astronomy site down to a dark sky community. And these are places that agreed to keep light uh, down to a minimum. There are and more being added on all the time. The uh, IDA is a part of that as well. So dark sky oasis primarily, again, this started off to protect observatories. That's the scientific value, but it, uh, it's important for the environment and biodiversity. I don't know if people are aware, but we're in the middle of an insect apocalypse right now. There are 40% less insects on the earth right now than there were 30 years ago. That's a huge decline. I mean, that would be considered a mass extinction, which is what it is. And some of it is insecticides. Some of it's loss of environment. A lot of it's just light pollution. And that's one thing we can, can do. Uh, how many people see fireflies? I used to have them in Gloucester all the time, just uh, 15 years ago. I rarely see them now, just, that's because of light pollution. If the male and female uh, fireflies can't see each other, you get no baby fireflies. It's as simple as that. Uh, but it involves all animals. Every animal out there needs a dark night. Um, and uh, in fact, there was a great talk by uh, someone from Tufts, a research student who I attended, uh, called uh, Why is Your Windshield Clean? Think about it. 30, 40 years ago, all windshields used to have bugs all over them, right? How many people complain about bugs on their windshield anymore? Right? You don't get that anymore. You know why? They're all dead. <laughs> there aren't that many bugs out there. Think about that. Um, I was on the human health side and it affects insomnia, obesity, high cholesterol because of stress, so hormones, diabetes, increase in heart disease and cancers. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a little while. Dark sky oasis has an economic value. How many people drive out where, I mean, we on our uh, email site, we get requests all the time, where's a good place to go observe, right? People go up to Maine, go up to uh, the Berkshires. That's happening worldwide. People want to have a dark sky place to go to and they're starting to be regulated by governments. And hopefully this will lead to international treaties to strengthen that and encourage it to get along. Um, astrotourism is becoming a big deal. People actually travel to dark sky sites like we do. I mean, we don't think anything of it. We think that's a natural thing to do. You talk to the average person out there, they have, who have never seen a dark sky, don't think anything of it until they actually see a dark sky. And their first reaction is, oh my God, <laughs> what have I been missing all these years, right? So it, it is an important thing and I'm glad the UN's getting involved. Um, and then there's cultural value for reasons for keeping the sky dark. This is my view of uh, M81. So um, this is the Bordel scale. I'm in Gloucester, I'm at 4.5. In uh, Florida, I'm at uh, six. But I, I would bet no, very few people in this club have ever been to a one. You've probably been to a two or three. A one, you have to be these days on the top of a mountain in the Andes. It's, uh, it, I've been there a couple of times to places like that, and it just blows your socks off. There's so many stars, I can't recognize the constellations. Until you see that, you un and understand what I mean, when you can't recognize, like Leo, and I've tried this, because there's just too many stars in the sky, 
you understand just what we're, we're losing and missing. So I'll give you an impact of that. At 5.5, um, we got basically uh, in half the sky, close to 1,900 stars, or above 10 degrees, 1,100 stars. When you go to 4.5, you're down to 368 stars. If you live in Somerville like Sal, you're at Bortle 2, you're seeing only 38 stars in the sky. So from the absolute best, like I, if we had no lights, 26,000 stars down to 22 stars because of our light pollution is just an amazing drop of uh, sky visibility. So the, um, we want to protect the lighting, not just for the observatories and for human health, but because it's in an environmental disaster happening before our eyes. So um, the UN is recommending, this is after, this is a 296 page report, and I'll give you the uh, URL so you can download it yourself if you want. It's well referenced. Uh, that limit the illumination to where it should be. And there should be master planning and zoning. This is Milan. And if you notice the very white brights, those are the 4,000 K lights that are starting to replace the older high pressure sodium. And you can see what a difference that'll make if they replace them all. Fortunately, people are trying to put a stop to that over there. Um, environmentally sensitive areas are uh, everywhere. Okay, it turns out. So here's a bridge that's lit up. There's a famous example from, uh, I think, Southern Oregon and, and Northern California, right near the border there, where someone thought it would be fantastic to light up the bridge, just so you can see it from miles away because it looks pretty that way, right? So they put up these 4,000 K lights. Salmon used to run under the bridge. They used to have like 30,000 salmon. Within a couple of years, it was down to 500 salmon and they went crazy trying to figure out what's killing all the salmon. So a researcher from Oregon figured it out. The salmon, by, by tracking them, by tagging them, the salmon swim upstream, but they will not pass the, the light. For some reason, they're afraid of crossing the light. So they stay downstream and uh, basically they die there instead of going upstream. And in the daylight, they don't move much apparently. So bottom line is it was all the lights from the bridge. They now have in that bridge, uh, they shut it off for two months during salmon season and the salmon population has come back. They should just get rid of the lights. It's completely useless. It doesn't light up the roadway. It just lights up the water. <laughs> the, I mean, those are the things you don't think about, uh, but every lighting has an effect on the outdoors. Um, this is the third recommendation from the UN uh, committee, illuminate levels for outdoor areas that are proper, make it even illumination and don't over illuminate. It's all common sense recommendations. Uh, adaptive lighting is coming into its own. Um, fortunately, in New Hampshire, people are cheap and you don't have a lot of uh, street lighting except in the very centers of towns. But uh, one thing that can be done for places that want light is, uh, especially for rural and suburban areas, you just have the lights with a sensor and just turn on when a car is approaching. There's no reason they have to be on 24-7. Um, that's one of the suggestions to be considered uh, internationally. That's actually going to be going over pretty big in uh, Europe. Um, watch the light distribution and control it design the luminaires <clears throat> so that they only shine the light where it's supposed to go and not above the horizon like this. Intrusive light. Would you wanna live in that apartment over here? Okay, not at all. Okay, so these lights should be shielded. They should be on a lower pole and it should have shades so you don't uh, shine into people's bedrooms. That affects human health. Um, the, there should be glare control, and that means shielding and proper design. Um, 
you know, many people have trouble driving at night, especially Yoli again. I got a couple of slides on that later. Um, and whenever patients say something wrong with my eyes, I say, well, no, not really, you're older, but it's really just stupid engineers. If lights were engineered properly, people could drive. Most older people have trouble driving, having no idea that the, they should put their ire on bad engineers rather than the, uh, uh, the fact that they're getting older. Uh, there's no reason for that. Here's a well-designed uh, field. Notice the light doesn't go outside. Look at, compare that to some of the fields you have around here. It's uh, night and day, right? So the spectral content emitted light is important. Um, you don't want blue. Blue is what causes most of the damage. It's 10 times more effective at suppressing melatonin than red uh, or green. So you want to limit the blue. Um, a, <clears throat> there are uh, LEDs that emit no blue. They're called amber LEDs instead of blue LEDs and eliminates it completely. They're using that in Sherbrooke, Canada. I wish that would catch on. Completely eliminates the problem. Doesn't cost any more. Uh, but the problem is, that, uh, I should explain what color correlated temperature is. It's a archaic way of describing color. But um, this goes back to the 18th century before lighting was even invented. But, uh, if, uh, but they're still using that system. So if you take a a poker iron, put it in a coal uh, burning uh, a stove, it'll turn dull red, then it'll turn uh, brighter, then it'll find, if you get it hot enough, it'll turn white, okay? That's color correlated temperature, and it's related to the light emitted by a hot iron, but for some reason they use that system uh, for this crime, even though it has nothing to do with the temperature of the, uh, of the LED. But uh, so when you see 2200K, that's kind of a reddish light. When you see 3000, it's a whitish light, slightly off white, 4000K is brilliant white light that uh, basically uh, blinds you. So the uh, AMA first five years ago recommended less than 3000 or lower the lighting industry keeps forgetting the all lower. We put that in in case there are advancements, which there are. The uh, UN, knowing that there's advances now, is recommending 2,200 to 3,000 um, and make them tunable. Uh, and white light is only for special areas where you absolutely need it, or in daytime in a <clears throat> in a apartment um, in an office building. You want the brighter light because if you get bathed with 4,000K in daylight, then at nighttime, you get a better bounce in terms of melatonin release. But you definitely don't, don't anyone put 4,000K in your house. You, you'll go nuts. Uh, people don't realize how bright that is and how awful it is. So finally, um, controlling color facades, that's becoming a problem because advertisers want to be everywhere and light measurements uh, to, uh, to monitor everything. So that in, in effect is the 10 recommendations from the UN that's in the report. Uh, it, if you think about it, it's really just common sense uh, and it's not that difficult to achieve, but it's revolutionary because the lighting in the industry for years uh, has been uh, uh, completely ignoring it and pushing back. They've come around of late. The IES is uh, partnered. I don't know what that means yet with the IDA, but hopefully that means there'll be some more uh, uh, basically cooperation. The CIE, which is the European version of the IES, uh, is much more uh, committed to watching their lighting, probably because Europe is so much worse than the US uh, across the, uh, the uh, entire continent, but they're, they're committed now and to partnering to lowering light levels. So that's a very good sign. And hopefully if the Europeans do that, it'll push the IS and the US to uh, do that as well. 
So the recommendation, the CUPO stands for Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. So the, this whole thing was under that uh, section of the uh, UN. So the default condition I like, no artificial light. If you don't need the light, don't put it up, okay? Again, there's no reason to put up a light in a park or in a uh, area where uh, there, there is no one there. An ecological reserve should be limited and <clears throat> no light above 500 nanometers. That's uh, basically green light. So no blue light whatsoever. If phosphor should be 22,000 K or less, Okay. Don't forget the IS blasted me for suggesting it shouldn't be about 3,000. That's because that's the best we had at the time. But now the UN's coming out and saying, actually, much lower is better. Uh, let me put things in perspective. The high pressure sodium that we're all used to in the past, that's 1,800. So 2,200 is whiter than those. Okay, So it's not that big a uh, deal. And exterior light should be below the horizontal. Um, this is 4565. So I was a part of the bioenvironment. Uh, what time is it? Okay. So, and uh, we basically stated blue rich light is a health risk uh, and got plenty of uh, paper backup. It's interesting when Richard Stevens, who started this in 1989, he was the first epidemiologist who uh, thought that lighting had a problem. He had no proof at the time, but he is an epidemiologist. He looks for patterns. Um, people poo pooed it. And then more studies came out in the 90s, showing him right. Then studies in the 2000s, then the 2010s. Now there are something like 30,000 papers in the medical literature worldwide showing that blue light is a problem. So this isn't speculation anymore. This is proven scientific fact. Um, so blue light suppresses melatonin, and that's a hormone that influences circadian rhythms. Even dim light can affect circadian rhythm. Eyes are exposed uh, to blue light decrease visual acuity because blue light scatters. I'm going to show you that in some slides. So the Bioenvironment Working Group had these goals. Review the existing literature on all of this, cancer, diabetes, obesity, and as well as the environment, birds, mammals, amphibians, and come up with, uh, put together a paper, a section for that, and put out recommendations to the UN. Uh, I should say this whole paper has gone to the UN uh, uh, CUPOS, and hopefully they'll release it to the General Assembly at some point when things like war in Ukraine and mass starvation uh, is out of the way so they can concentrate on this. Uh, they're a little preoccupied right now for obvious reasons. The, uh, but the paper's in. Uh, so here's the bioenvironment team. I was part of it. I was a presenter as well. James Lowenthal, by the way, is in Massachusetts. Uh, he's uh, with, get which university right now. He's in Western Mass. Travis Longcore is one of the best uh, environmental scientist I've ever met. He's at University of California, and he's produced numerous papers. In fact, he helped me write the UN paper. He's a fantastic uh, presenter. <clears throat> so, in fact, that may be, I'm sure we could probably get him to do a, a Zoom meeting for us. Um, so, here are the main presenters. I was one of the main presenters. Melatonin, this is what we're talking about. This is the, uh, the hormone, it's produced by the pineal gland and you produce it when you're in the dark. During the daytime, you produce essentially zero. It's related to mood and depression. It affects uh, reproductive physiology and may affect uh, women's uh, fertility. It, it helps fight breast cancer. Now, let me explain that. Melatonin, a lack of melatonin doesn't cause cancer. Okay, because I get asked this all the time. Let me explain how this works. Melatonin is an adjuvant. What that means is when you produce it, it, it during sleep at night, the body goes through a repair cycle, gets rid of dead cells, cleans up the brain uh, from memories, 
uh, and gets rid of toxins. Sleep is important. That's why we sleep. If you don't believe it, try staying up for a week without sleep. You'll collapse. Okay, there's a reason why we sleep, and it, it's basically to clean up. But um, the melatonin gets produced at night, helps you fall asleep. The melatonin is an adjuvant, and with, by that I mean we have uh, an immune system composed of uh, certain cells, like T cells and killer cells, uh, that uh, immune cells that are produced recognize an antigen and go and kill it. So that's how we fight diseases. That's how you get over a cold. Your immune system kills off the, uh, the cells that are damaged and the viruses and the bacteria. What melatonin does is it stimulates and enhances the effectiveness of our killer T cells. So hopefully this is kind of a shock to you, but we produce billions of new cells every day. And all that reproduction, that division, there's bound to be some mistakes. Those mistakes mostly die off because they're mistakes. A few of them live and are cancerous, meaning they can re replicate themselves. That's a cancer. We produce, it's estimated, eight to 10 cancer cells every single day in your body since the day you were born. But we're not dead of cancer. Why? because we have an immune system that recognizes this is a bad cell, attaches to it and kills the cell. That's why we don't die of cancer from the week we're born. The, so if you think about that, all melatonin does is prevent, uh, is, is stimulate the immune system to help kill off these daily cancer cells that we produce. So it's no stretch of the imagination if you think about this logically. If you suppress your melatonin, that means your immune system isn't as strong. A couple of those, maybe one or two of those cancer cells now slip through the cracks. That's why there's an increase in hormonal related cancers if you have suppressed melatonin. Hopefully that makes sense. That any longer explanation require a, a full medical uh, talk. I'm sure you don't want to hear. So actually, we talked about rods and cones earlier, right? But there is a, uh, there, we have three uh, cones, which are red, green, blue, our color vision, and rods, one it only sees primarily in the uh, greenish uh, area. Uh, but it's uh, not color, doesn't give you any color. It just allows you to see in the dark and some of for motion as we talked about earlier. But there's a fifth one that was discovered in 2003. No one knew this was there, and, but although now it's nearly 20 years old, it's called melanopsin. That particular cell has nothing to do with vision, even though it's embedded in our retina. That cell goes to the pineal gland and its only purpose appears to be to suppress melatonin from the pineal gland. So if you're blind, you never get suppression, you get melatonin's up all the time. If you're a normal sighted person um, and you lived in a cave, as a caveman, this is how we evolved, um, blue light would come in from the sky, you know it's daylight, and the, the melanopsin suppresses pineal gland and stimulates the reticulum part of the brain and wakes you up and makes you ready to go. And at night, when it's dark, melatonin rises, melanopsin doesn't get any signal, and your body starts saying, I'm sleepy. Okay? That's how our human, and that's the only purpose of that cell is to control our wake life cycle. Um, so here is. Uh, I'm going to go through this quickly because you've heard my <clears throat> talk before on this, but the um, why the DA may get involved? Because the lighting industry took no account of environmental or human health effects when they're promoting their lighting practices. And they were furious that we even brought this up. Absolutely furious. Uh, they've since calmed down. And hopefully now that they're partnered with the IDA, uh, good things will uh, go future, although I'm still not 
particularly happy with them. I mean, I, I've saved some of these emails. I got hate mail from the IES. That's unbelievable. <laughs> it's just plain unbelievable. Basically, the, the letter said, stay in your lane. You're just a doctor. <laughs> and I, so my response to them was kind of like the gun industry. I'll stay in my lane. I, I put it in nicer ways, but I'll stay in my lane when you stop poisoning my patients with your bad lighting. Um, so the, uh, that's why the AMA got involved because it was a health, human health issue. Because the only way to get something past the AMA is one, it's gotta be scientifically proven Okay, this went through multiple reviews through several universities. And two, it's got to have a uh, health angle. Okay, so that's why we got involved. Um, the fact that I was an amateur astronomer was interested in help push it, that's another matter. <laughs> so, glare. Um, the thing about LEDs is their pinpoints. And when they focus on the back of your retina, uh, they're extremely annoying uh, to the point where you want to go like this, right? When you see, uh, you want to raise your hands and block the, um, uh, the light because it's so intense. Human tolerance is 50,000. It's uh, many of these are in the millions. And that's why you have an aversion to, it's like looking at the surface of the sun, except it's pinpoint. So why do elderly drivers have a problem? So a little, and a little bit of physiology here. When you're born, you have a lens that has no blood cells to go into. I don't like every other tissue in your body you, that has blood cells to keep it alive. The, ret, the uh, lens only gets its nutrients through the liquid that surrounds it. So it gets all its oxygen and glucose through stuff that diffuses in the aqueous humor of the eye and that diffuses into the lens and the cells stay alive. Once you hit about 40 to 50, you average 45, the center of the lens is now thick enough, the lens is thick enough that the center doesn't get enough nutrients. It starts to die. It, uh, and when it dies, it calcifies. So you get these micro calcifications in the center of the uh, lens. And that's why you get more scatter. And what scatters the most? blue, red penetrates the best. So the more blue light you have, the more scatter you have, and you get this, this snowstorm effect when you're looking at a light, okay? Um, so if you, here's a chart <coughs> on this side, you can see my pointer, right? So I'm not just, okay. So when you're young, 20 years old, it takes like 1,800 Lamberts before you get what's called disability glare, where the glare is so bad, you don't see well. When you're age 60, one third as much. So the older you are, the less light it takes to give you disability glare. That's why older drivers have a problem. The second part of that, and this is a chart from uh, a researcher in uh, Netherlands, I forget his name right now. Actually, I should have put those at the bottom. I should always reference my slides. Um, the, uh, he took human eyes, and notice this is a log scale over here and shown blue light, green, yellow, and red light. And lo and behold, the blue scatters the most. These are through human eyes, okay? And that's not surprising. Why is the sun red at night as it's setting, right? In the evening, because the blue scatters most through a denser atmosphere. So only the red penetrates. Same thing in the human eye. So the red penetrates. So if you have lights that are warm, you can see better because you don't have the big scatter from the blue and the green. Simple physics. Now the IS kept making these ridiculous statements that you need um, the 4,000 K lights in order to see better down the road. So Alan Lewis is one of the former presidents of the IAS who disagrees with them. <laughs> and I'm using his slide with his permission. So here you have 2,700, 3,500, and 6,000 K LED lights. This is his own research, his own testing. Notice that you can see better. The difference in is just a couple of feet in seeing down the road. Okay, 
So an eccentricity just means if you're looking off to the side, but you know, you shouldn't be looking at the buildings on the side of the road, you should be looking down the road. Down the road, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference by their own data. That's why they haven't sent me any papers <laughs> because their own data proves them wrong. And I use that all the time against them. Uh, Ronald Gibbons also, I guess he's a Virginia Tech. He's one of the good guys who supports uh, good lighting. And he showed that uh, he did studies when clear weather, fog and rain. Now in clear weather, the old 1800 high pressure sodium would best. <laughs> you can see best down the road. 6,000 K was the worst, okay? Basically everything the IES tells you, these lighting en engineers is a lie. They don't look at their own data. Now, is blue light uh, a health risk? Yes, it is. So you, I already talked about the melanopsin, goes to the pineal gland and stimulates the limbi limbic system. That's how you wake up, that's how you fall asleep. Here's a graph showing the different, uh, what time is it by the way, how, how am I doing? Can I keep going for another 10 minutes? Okay, so um, the melanopsin suppression is peaks at about 460. The lighting engineers say, well, we should have 4,000 K. The, the way they make these lights is they take a blue LED and put a phosphor on it. This is what you're trying to get, this big hump over here, because that's the useful light. The problem is, you get this spike over here of, that shines through the phosphor of blue light. It's completely useless light. If you had an amber LED, you'd have none. At least you can minimize it by going to 2700K. There the blue peaks here. And you get a big rise in uh, the useful light, which is in the warmer section, which is why we should be using 2700 or below. I already told you that the um, melatonin is an uh, immune adjuvant. It also controls our uh, daily clock chain. Many of our genes are controlled by our internal clock. That's why you get jet lag. Well, it turns out five to 10% of all our genes are clock controlled. So is it a big stretch of the imagination to say, that you, if you screw up your circadian rhythm and you screw up 10% of your gene uh, manifestations in the course of a day, you're gonna have a problem? Of course you are. It's still being worked out why, but it is a problem. By the way, the people who figured this out, 2017 won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. So at least the Nobel Committee thinks I'm right and the lighting engineers wrong. Um, circadian uh, disruption, as a, you would of course expect sleep and cognition problems, but there's now evidence for breast and prostate cancers, obesity, diabetes, and mood disorders. Breast cancer. This was all proposed at first that if you have uh, melatonin suppression, you should have shift workers a higher risk. That's now proven by multiple studies. Blind women are lower risk. That's proven, okay? This is one study that I've read, which is incredible if you think about it. They found uh, twin women around the world. They got 400 twins, one of which was blind. I don't know how they could find that many uh, twins with one person blind and the other one not, but there was something like 400 people in the study. And sure enough, even though they're twins, exact same genes, exact same environment, one blind, one not, the blinded one had a much lower risk of breast cancer than the unblinded one, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. So here's my favorite study, and this is by uh, David Blask from Tulane. Okay, so this just takes a little bit of explaining. Blask is a researcher. He worked with uh, what's called nude mice. These aren't uh, ex exhibitionist mice there. Mice that are bred to accept transplants. So he took these nude mice and transplanted human breast cancer into them, 120 of them. And they were broken up into lots of 20 mice. So the mice that had a normal daylight dark cycle, this is the rate of growth of the breast cancer. 
ones that had just a tiny amount of light, this is less than a night light, had a slightly increased rate of breast cancer growth. The ones with more light had a higher rate of breast cancer. The ones that were put in constant light, no night cycle, the breast cancer literally exploded out of their chest. Proof positive that light will affect cancer rate growth. And this is human breast cancer implanted in a mice. So one of the best studies came right out of here in Massachusetts with Harvard, um, and although it's a countrywide uh, study, they're the ones that uh, ran the study. And they followed 110,000 women uh, since the 1990s for uh, a number of years till 2013, 89 till 2013, right there. Um, and <laughs> they were looking for a number of things as to human health, but one of them was the effect of light pollution. And the way they went back and what they did is they knew the zip code of everyone who was in the study and they used satellite imaging of where that zip code was. And they broke up the, uh, the, the, the 110,000 women into five quintiles. One was the highest light rate of light pollution, one was the lowest. The ones from the highest to the lowest had a 14% increased risk of breast cancer, okay? That's it. And everything in between had a uh, slightly higher, slightly higher until you get to the highest rate. Now, you're never gonna get 50% or higher because 60% of breast cancers are from the BRAC gene. That's genetic and that's unchangeable. But of the 40% that are left, this is about a third of them, okay? So, um, the Harvard also came up with a similar study for men and it shows prostate cancer increases in light pollution for the same reason, melatonin suppression. Lest you think that study is an outlier, there are now 22 other studies that have shown the exact same thing all around the world. Uh, now, I don't expect you to read this, but this is one, this one's from Israel, two, two are from Israel. This is another one from the USA. It's from Connecticut, a worldwide study, South Korea and a bunch of others, okay? And uh, every one of them showed 12 to 17% increase in breast cancer. When you have 22 studies that show the exact same thing, you can't say it's a fluke anymore, right? I hope everyone agrees with that. There was one negative study from Canada, okay? And they went back and looked at that. Why was that one different? Well, it turns out in Canada, in the summertime, the sun never sets. So what do you do? You have light blocking shades. Every, these people have light blocking shades. So they don't care what the outdoor lights are at night. They don't get to see them because they already have fixed the problem. That's why this one is the only negative study. So many cities have adopted 4,000 K lighting. Uh, New York City, one of the worst light polluted areas in the universe. Uh, put up, started putting up 4,000 K lights in Queens. This is what it looked like from a, a person who lent me their slide. And it was awful. People hated it. They, they finally got New York City to put up 3,000 K and no more 4,000 K lights. Seattle was one of the first adopters. I think it was nine, uh, 2009, they put up uh, 4,000 K lights. Three years ago, Seattle, out of constant pressure from the citizens, are replacing all their 4,000 K lights. They're putting up 2,700 to 3,000 K lights and it should be finished in the next few years. Once you live on the 4,000 K lights, you hate them. You don't realize it, how bad they are until you have to live with them. Uh, Pittsburgh earlier this year voted to replace all their 4,000 K lights. So we're winning slowly because people are, are being annoyed by scenes like this. So human, in, uh, so, this is what the AMA uh, basically said, that we should use LED lights because it decreases fossil fuel use and it's more energy efficient. We never said don't switch. Encourages minimizing and control in blue rich light. That's where we get the uh, lighting engineers because for some reason they like blue lights. And all we said, and here is it is in red, use 3000 K or lower. Now let's keep forgetting the lower because at the time uh, 3000 was the only thing we had. Um, and all LED lighting should be properly shielded. I consider that common sense. Uh, I don't know why the ES uh, took a conniption over it, but I'm glad to see this slowly coming around. 
Oh, this is uh, Centaur A from Florida. This is with my 14 inch. That's a great object, by the way. <laughs> so let me just go through Travis Lanko's uh, presentation quickly, uh, and then pretty much at the end. S basically, uh, the entire world, outdoor animals need nighttime dark lights, uh, darkness. Okay, I already told you about bridges and how it affects fish in the water, uh, bats, birds. Birds die all the time. Is a everyone know in uh, Las Vegas that uh, pyramid that shoots up this light into the sky? Okay, here's what people don't know. They have a team that they hire every morning to go around the base of the building to sweep up all the dead birds. They they, can't, they basically collect about. Uh, 40 to 100 dead birds every single day because they're attracted by that stupid beam. Okay, they should, uh, they should be bombed. <laughs> they're mass killing birds because of that. Right, and they uh, crash into the building, right? Well, they just circle around and just drop dead and they or drop crash dead. into, you know. Uh, insects, 40% less insects than we had in uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Amphibia are affected. Migration routes of birds. Finally, uh, Boston just uh, signed on. We're going to shut off some lights during bird migration time. So, uh, and uh, Toronto started that. And it's worldwide. Wherever birds go over big cities, they have major bird kills. So it's, it, uh, it's called the flap program to shut down some of the lights. Now, here's something you wouldn't expect. Just to show you, it affects everything, OK? So why is there algae all along the shores of Florida? and many large cities. Now they have all these algae blooms. Some of it's uh, runoff of uh, fertilizers, yes, but the algae naturally grow. What happens at night is zooplankton come up from the depths and eat it. And then in the daytime, they go back down to the depths to protect themselves. If there's light shining in the water, the zooplankton won't come up and eat it. That's one of the reasons we have all these algae blooms because there's no zooplankton to eat it because we have so many damn lights in the water. <laughs> Think about that. Who would have thought we'd be affecting algae growth and zooplankton? Um, ecological functions, birds, uh, I mean, yeah, well, birds, bees, moths are all pollinators and they're dying off. A lot of it's because of the lights. It affects the food supply. That, well, that's one of the reasons why they have to bring bees to farms to pollinate the uh, crops because there's less bees. <laughs> um, so it affects uh, plants as well. Let me move through this more quickly. Um, so it affects uh, reproduction of birds and insects. Uh, it affects plants. Trees that are lit up all the time die about half, only have half the lifetime of trees that are not. Okay, it's a proven fact. So if you want to protect your trees, don't light them up all night long. I don't know why, but this, <laughs> but I think it's, uh, they, they've studied it. Superoxide radicals triggered stress uh, responses in the trees. So here's a great quote. So it affects a lot of things. Here's a quote from the Nature paper in January, 2019. And I, I'm gonna read this. If a species is not yet known to be affected by artificial light at night, it is likely because we simply have not studied it yet. In his, he studied multiple different uh, uh, animals and plants. And he basically says, everything he studies, there is an effect of light pollution on everything. He's yet to come across a negative study. So that's why he made that quote. He said, if it's not proven yet, it's probably because it hasn't been studied yet. So the conclusions are we should control light at night and avoid the adverse uh, effects. This is uh, Thor's helmet. So the rest is just a couple of slides and I'll uh, answer questions. So protecting the ground-based observatories, this is what the UN wants to do. I know time's getting light, so I'm gonna skip over that. You already know all this anyways. Uh, this is from Tucson, you got light domes in the distance. Uh, but I'm, this is from uh, uh, the observatory, Kitt Peak. 
you can see that, that light domes from Tucson and Phoenix, even though they have some relatively good light uh, pollution control over there. Um, World Observatories are under threat. Uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory I mentioned is specifically on the threat because they, they'll they saturate the, uh, you, you can get rid of the trails if it's not saturated. When you have something as sensitive as the Vera Rubin uh, telescope, if it saturates the sensor, it's, it's impossible to get rid of it. The, the, the uh, imagers in the group know exactly what I'm talking about. So the recommendations to the UN were no development near ecologically sensitive sites, monitor nighttime conditions, and keep nat darkness as a natural resource and restoration plans to claw back some night sky areas. Then the satellite working group uh, has been uh, mostly professionals looking at what they're trying to do. Uh, this is Starlink. This is a map with 4,400 satellites. Musk wants to put up 60,000. Okay, think about that. Not, and Mark, this is- I, hmm? I was gonna say, Mario, I, I describe it as putting a chain link fence around the earth. That is correct. Here is, here is an image from an, a professional observatory. They can get rid of these faint ones. They can't get rid of this. No, no, they don't have a program to do that. You just lose data. And this is uh, another observatory that got Starlink. So they tried to put some mitigation things. They're trying to orient them. They're trying to darken them. But all that did is go from uh, uh, magnitude 5.5 with the original to set magnitude 7. It's still too bright for imaging, even though you won't see them visually. Then you have OneWeb. They, they were inspired by Musk. This is from England. They want to put up 50,000 satellites. Basically, if we let all these companies that are in a rush to corner the market, we'll have about 300,000 satellites by 2030. Okay, There will be no stars. There will be no astronomy. They're trying to get a national. This is one of the main reasons to submit it to the uh, UN. We'll hopefully, we'll get a national, international treaty on this. So the main recommendations are as seen there. Uh, but basically try to limit this and uh, have national treaties. Radio observatories, same thing. There's another section just for that. And uh, so I'll go through that and it gives some recommendations on how to limit that. So these are the final recommendations for CUPOS. So here's my image of the uh, section of the uh, uh, Western Vale. So I'll stop there and answer any questions. If, uh, if you uh, want the actual UN report, here is the direct link. It'll come up as a small window, just download it, 296 pages, a PDF. However, to make it a little easier, if you want, go to my webpage, which is easy to remember. Uh, on the main page, go halfway down, you'll see more on light pollution, click on that. And if you scroll down, you'll see a link directly to the UN report, as well as the links to my uh, AMA reports and others. So don't any questions? What's that? Mario. Don't forget the newsletter also. That also has the UN link. OK, great. So the newsletter is something you receive online? I, see, I used to look see? at the newsletter and it's paper. Now I don't see it. It is also online. It's at, on the Atmob website also. It is open and free, open to the public. Mario, I have a couple of a couple of comments, if I if I might. Yeah. Um, you know, it, on one hand, it sounds like you just feel like despair that that this is just a, a problem that's just beyond our control. But 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 when you talk about all the ding, all the things that could be done, it makes me think there is hope. Um, yeah. You know, it, despair it, and hope. Uh, I'll answer that both. I, I have both. And the, uh, the hope is because people have finally taken notice. I'm hopeful in the, within a few years we have an international treaty. I'm hopeful that governments will take effect. I'm hopeful that Pittsburgh, Seattle, and other cities are now finally getting the message that they got to control their light pollution and, and are taking steps to do it. So all that is hope. 
My despair is the vast majority of the human population could care less, don't I, understand I what the issue is, and still believe that they have to light up every blade of grass or someone will steal the grass. Well, I was going to say, uh, that's what I was going to make a comment. It, you know, I know it's easier to control municipalities. And if you can get, if you can enact, you know, legislation to get communities, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the public lighting, street lights, um, yeah. that's one, that's one issue. But I drive down, I drive down my road at midnight, coming back from the clubhouse, one in the morning, and it's like daylight. People have like the garage lights on, the light over the front door is on, the light out in the front lawn is on it's crazy for no, yeah. the, no one is awake and i know there, and then no the, with the leds are so cheap to run that you don't really notice it much in your electric bill you know i've known i i should ask gently of the well we it's a city now framing him as a city but i swear that the the, the street lights look more yellow than they did a month ago a lot of towns are putting up 2,700 now and they're a little more yellow. I, I mean, I've been looking at this for years, so I can tell you just by looking at it, if it's a 4,000K, a 3,000K, a 2,700 or 2,200, I can do that now. But yeah, if you can. look at them critically and carefully, especially at the side, but in fact, I had a slide, but I just had too many slides to show that you can see the different colors. But um, uh, yeah, um, right now, if I had my druthers, uh, we'd ha all have amber lights or at a minimum 2,200 to 2,400 lights. Jim Those Brothers was telling me that he, he, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. And he, he said, you, you see that little thing on the top of your lights, you know, the street lights. And he said, it used to be like a photo sensor. He said, now most, in most communities, that's a Wi-Fi connection that allows the, the town or city to control that light from a computer. Yep. That's becoming I I commoner. Yeah. I, yep, I have I, asked that the lights on my Here's the problem. Line. So the city uh, would normally, you think, have an incentive to put that up, cut the wattage down, and save electricity. But the good old national grid and the other uh, lighting companies don't tariff them that way. They basically give you a set price, whether you use 1% of the electricity or 100% of the electricity, you pay the same. So if you're a city manager, why spend a couple of extra bucks for a control on a light if you're not if you're not going to get any payback? Sure. Okay, sure. you've got to change the tariff structure, and that's part of the uh, state bill that we're trying to pass. It changes the tariff structure, so if cities actually get a deduction on their electric bill if they cut down the wattage, then you'll see those become very common because now there's an incentive to spend the money to put those up because you're gonna save money in the long run. My street lights are on in broad daylight in my neighborhood. <laughs> They've got yeah, the little they don't care. cap on top. Yeah, yeah they don't like, care. Early on in your presentation- they're, they're LED just... lights and even in broad daylight, they're glaring to, to witness. Yeah. That's how freaking bright they are. National so, Grid charges the city $95 per street light for the year. It's just flat out charge. Okay, it should, if we can change the tariffs so that they get a discount if they dim them or turn them off, then there'll be, then there'll be change. In my notes, they just wrote car headlights with two exclamation points. Those, those, uh, those, those are killers. Lamps. That is a long story. I was in touch with a representative from California, blocking on his name, but he's retiring the end of uh, this year. He was in charge of the uh, committee that controls that. The, the Energy Committee on Energy controls streetlights. Okay, that's easy to understand. Cars are in a completely separate system, have nothing to do with the Department of Energy. And in fact, what Congress basically done is regulate yourself. Yeah, there is no regulation. There used to be regulation. There's a very interesting Wikipedia rabbit hole about headlight technology over the years and used to be uh, sealed bulbs that are like standardized. All the cars use the same exact, like four different types of bulbs and had very specific dispersion patterns. And, you know, the driver side light would be aimed downward and the passenger side would be aimed upward and outward to- Yeah, but there's no regulation on the brightness or the intensity. Yeah 
or the CCT. Yeah, it used to be that way, but now it's just the Wild West. You can correct you know, do whatever you want. Mario. Hello, yeah. Mario. Hey, um, how you doing? Hi, how are you? Um, where I, I used to work um, at Brigham and Women's in the NICU as a technician, the nurses would often complain about getting headaches from the blue phototherapy. Yep. Um, 460 to 490 millimeter thereabouts. Um, so I, I sent you a, a quick text with a couple of links that kind of, I think, may document that as a direct consequence of light scatter yeah, the reason they put uh, the blue light on the kids is because of a bill of right it breaks it uh, down but the kids are only exposed for a few days so it doesn't lead to last damage the nurses well, are exposed to it forever the nurses are exposed <laughs> on a daily basis so here is a sample of one of i don't know if you can see this there are 400 wait a minute 320 leds that uh, will shine um the infant's eyes are, sh are shielded, granted, but they've come up with various methods of trying to blanket the top of the phototherapy light so the light scatter doesn't impact the staff, but nevertheless, it has. Yeah. So I just thought I would point that out. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised and I'm aware of it. And uh, if you're exposed to blue light, you have some serious health effects over time. Mario, Dean has her hand up. Is uh, is this uh, presentation going to be made available? Uh, this talk tonight, do you have? Was it is recorded? It, I don't know. It can it be streamed in. over uh, like YouTube? Yeah, I'm. I'm. So I, we're recording it tonight, obviously, and uh, I'll, I will first have a member only version, but I will release I can release a public version. And if there's interest, I can make a version which just has a talk portion. The reason I ask uh, about getting maybe just the talk portion is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was asked by a state representative here in Rhode Island to join a committee on light pollution and studying uh, the effects of the light pollution. I think this talk would be an excellent uh, way of introducing the committee to the problems, not only of the health effects, but also the nice guy environment uh, effects too. Great, any way I can help, let me know. Christine has her hand up. Christine, you have a question? Hi, thanks Dr. Mata for, for explaining all of this. Um, Two things I want to say, Phil, my daughter spent the first six weeks of her life in a level four Nick at the Brigham. Um, and the staff there was just simply amazing. So I, I don't know if you were there in 1991, but that's that's when she was there. So, yeah, I was I was there. Good to hear. Yeah, no, that was um, a difficult time. But but the uh, the staff was simply amazing. Uh, Dr. Mota, uh, maybe a little bit off track, but maybe a little bit related. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. My students, I, I, I'm a teacher. My students, you know, we see the effects of the kids coming into school, usually because they've been playing video games all night. Um, and what about glare from computer screens? Yeah. So it's an interesting story. One of my great successes, once the AMA report came out. Um, the uh, some companies looked at it and acted, and others didn't. Apple, for example, on the iPhone, within a year of the AMA report, Apple now your Apple phone automatically turns uh, yellow and eliminates blue. Um, most people around nine o'clock, you can change that setting or eliminate it if you want. But that was a direct action from the AMA report. So that's why Apple dims their phones. Other companies uh, have uh, unfortunately done nothing and the IS uh, for years have fought us, although hopefully uh, they're now coming around. TV screens are a whole nother matter, okay? Well, let me, uh, computer screens, you can download a program that eliminates blue 
and uh, well, it's Windows called a, has it built yeah. in directly now. Windows. Yeah, you can just Google that, and you can uh, make a computer screen uh, eliminate blue. And I, in fact, I use that uh, all the time when I uh, observe, uh, and it's great. Uh, it, 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 you can make a red screen, of course, but that makes eliminates the ability to see certain things. But if you eliminate the blue, it's not too bad. TVs, unfortunately, uh, have no regulation on that. And that's indoors. And that's, you know, the best way to get to sleep. <clears throat> Turn off the TV, read a book for an hour before you go to bed. But uh, it's hard to tell a teenager that, right? A lot of TVs, uh, modern TVs, do have color temperature controls because I have to use that in my business as a camera person because I have to match uh, color temperatures to the outside light if I don't want the outside to be blue and the inside to be yellow. So there are a lot of the monitors that are out there where you can go into settings and change the color temperature of the uh, of the monitor a cheaper monitor might not be able to do that but but uh, it's they do give a lot of the modern monitors do give you the option of changing the color temperature it doesn't hmm. change automatically for you but you can go in and and manipulate it because i i do it all the time in order to get tvs to not be blue when i'm using tungsten light to light indoors um, and a lot of the LED walls that are out there. I was just at one of the Harvard's new theater and they have a the entire back wall of this new theater at the business school is a giant LED wall. And I asked about that because they use tungsten lighting to light the audience, <laughs> but they have all the they they tend to try to light to the to the uh, with their theater lights, they light to the screen. Um, but it do, it also has the ability to change color temperature, and it also has the ability to change the amount of light that's coming out of it. Because those things, like you said, a giant LED wall like the ones at Re the Red Sox Stadium, those are really really bright. Uh, but they can actually dim them um, because they're they they can compete with the sun. That's why you can see them at, during the day so well. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, yeah there is pretty bright. However, uh, TV screens and computer monitors in the store are set up to be very blue because it looks you know bright, so they can sell you these bright shiny displays. So uh, typically, you have to have to uh, make it more red yourself. You, yes. they don't come that way. Yeah. <laughs> I just um I just adjusted my iPhone. This is an old version eight. Um, by going into settings and brightness, um, um, display and brightness, there's a button I mean, that says- can, And you can set settings. what time that occurs every day. Yeah, you can set it up as a schedule. And I have yeah. it shifted all the way to the warm thing and it, it looks perfectly fine. Yeah. You know, so I have it set to go from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Good. Yeah. I didn't, thanks, I didn't your know I you do that. Yeah. Your eye adjusts yeah. to the yeah. Apple was color one of the first adopters. They, they contact the AMA about the report, and believe it or not, they acted upon it within months. It's unbelievable. Good good for them. Yeah, Your eye adjusts. You get used to the change in color temperature. Yeah, it doesn't take long. I was just looking at it. That's how I've been looking down. I was looking at my phone. And yeah, it looks great. I, so I'm going to do my iPad, too. Mario, I can't remember whether it was the... I can't remember where I saw the video. It was all about... I think there one of the uh, things was in Seattle. It was a dark sky. Uh, it might have been on the dark sky side or one of the uh, meetings that I attended where they talked about where they they went to a town and they had the police and fire department people walk through the town at night with the lights fully up. And then they came back. They took the people away. They dropped the lighting by 50 percent. Uh, roughly 50% and had the same people come back and comment on whether they, well, they didn't tell them anything. They just said, Hey, we want you to walk the streets and give us your comments again. And no one noticed mm -hmm. they had, they, because it, it was all about, you know, well, we have to have the lights at hundred percent in order to have safe, safe lighting. And that's, that was the demonstration. And they then told everybody, guess what? We dropped the lights by 50%. And every one of you said that there was plenty of light here 
for to do your job and to have a safe parking lot or a safe, you know, street. And it lowered the amount of glare. Yep. Um, not entirely because that's a lot has to do with the design of the light, but it, but it does take some of the glare down. I thought that was a really fascinating talk well, where, you know, it's all perception. Not, not to talk medicine all night, but there's a reason for that. You have a pupil. It, it can constrict to one millimeter or it can dilate to seven millimeters. So if you increase the intensity of the light, all that does is make you constrict your pupil down. And if you dim the light a bit, your pupil opens up. To the brain, it all looks the same level. Okay, so that, that's why that is the case. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting you should mention that because I, one of the speakers that I was videotaping the other day at Harvard uh, has developed a new medical lens for your eye, which will basically, I won't have to wear readers anymore, but there's an eye drop that does the same thing. And I said to her, I go, so how does she, she won some big award the other day. And I said, how does the eye drop work? And she said, well, it does the opposite of what the eye doctor does. Instead of dilating your eye, it, it, closes the iris down so that your depth of field becomes greater. Therefore, you don't need the reading glasses. But she said, then go out. <laughs> well, she said, then try to drive your car at night. She said, it's not a good idea to have to put those drops in your eyes a few hours before. So when you see the ad that says, hey, you don't need reading glasses anymore. All you got to do is put these drops in your eyes. Just don't try to drive at night. <laughs> you might have some problems for the but same reason. As a physician, uh, I'm going to say this as a physician. Yep. About, a, uh, about a quarter of all the medical advances out there, stay away from. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that yep. sounds like one of them. Hey, yeah. Chris, Chris <clears throat> Elledge, do we, do we have a limit on recording time? I'm just curious. I think I have plenty of space on my hard drive. Okay. Because <laughs> I was going to say, if you want, we can we can officially end the meeting part and then we can just continue our, our chatting if you want. Yeah, you, that, can, you can go ahead and close, it's fine. So is that okay with you, Mario, if I just Absolutely. officially close the meeting out? So yeah. I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna stop your sharing and I'm gonna go back to my sharing just so I can put the last slide up. I'm gonna shrink you all down so I can see it. Mario, thank you so much. That was a fabulous, fabulous presentation. Lots to think oh. about, lots to do. Excuse me, I did have a question to Mario if there is a like time. Phil, there will be in one second. Okay. So, so let me just close out the meeting officially. The next monthly meeting of, of the AppMob is on Thursday, June 9th. It'll be our annual business meeting. We'll, um, we'll offer up uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, elect uh, the, the new board. Um, and they'll meet for the first time on at the next ADMA board meeting, which is on Thursday, June 23rd, eight o'clock PM. As you, you know, I'll send out invites to all of those and I hope to see you there.